Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran New York City jazz guitarist Greg Scaff. We talked to him about his latest 2021 CD, Polaris, featuring a masterful trio with bassist Ron Carter and drummer Albert Tootie Heath. Originally from Wichita, Kansas, he is well known for his work with soul jazz legends and with groups based around the Hammond B3. He has five feature albums that have been very well received by jazz fans everywhere. He's a great cat. Enjoy his tale. Thanks for having me do this. Oh, yeah, man. I love the album. I, you know, it's one of those things where, and the line of work that I'm in here with, with running a, a, a radio show, when I hear certain albums, it's like, yeah, I want to talk to this cat. I want to see what's up. Oh, really? Man, thank you. I, I guess I had no idea how it would be, um, you know, how, what people would think of the record. I just wanted to do it so bad. Well, I think we're in a unique time right now because everything's so upside down and backwards and just silly that if you could get something that has it has a tranquility, has a, a sonic piece to it that just makes you feel good and kind of takes you back to why you like jazz to begin with, there's there's something to be said about that. I, I didn't begin this project. I hadn't begun this project when the pandemic was raging, but I... I'd, started it in 2019 i i just had to get together with those guys um i i mean i had a i had one session where we did the whole record the i think this the amount of time we spent recording was about six hours and um in two different sessions of three hours a piece and i had you know been working in ron carter's big band for several years the big band only works about once a year but when you do it's a week at a time and it was after about the third time i had done that i decided man i've got to record with this guy it's and it was a really great experience i don't know if that'll happen again i can't imagine a big band getting together now because just because when you consider how a big band is usually set up it's so tight on the stage yeah but but who knows eventually i would think that's a pretty big deal when you have two nea jazz masters in the room with as much experience as they have and you know i mean if you didn't know who was on the album and you just listened to this you just immediately know the quality and the and the oh tenor of what was going on yeah oh thank you well and and uh let me in, uh, add that when we recorded, I didn't, and I think uh, Tootieth had not been, he wasn't yet an NEA jazz master. But, but uh, yeah, what I was saying was I had worked in Ron's big band, and, and the other thing is in that band, the guitarist has a f- sort of a front row seat, so to speak, because the guitar is seated right next to Ron on Ron's left side, which is just a fantastic experience that I really enjoyed and it seemed like I felt like I had a musical bond with him from doing that and also you know I was aware that Ron has somewhat of a rapport with guitarists such as Bill Frisell and Russell Malone Russell plays in Ron's trio Pat he had works with Pat Metheny, Jim Hall, and not to mention the records that he made back in the day with Wes, with Wes Montgomery, I decided I I needed to record with him. So I asked him, after thinking about it for a while, I asked him, and he said yes. So then I had to think about a drummer. And um, about that time, I happened to walk into smoke jazz club one night and tootie heath was playing drums and when i heard him i was just knocked out and i thought he'd be the perfect drummer for what i wanted to do and i had i remembered that tootie and ron had worked together about 60 years ago with bobby timmons but i i so after the gig i wanted to approach him after the gig he um he was standing outside the club, and I walked up to him and introduced myself and said I wanted to do a record with him. And <laughs> Tootie said something like, he was kind of dismissive. He said, yeah, but I'm tired. I want to go home. I'm waiting for a ride. 
so I, you know, I just thought, oh, okay, that didn't work. But I kept thinking about his playing that night and how I'd really like to have him do the record. And I managed to get his phone number from his brother Jimmy, and I just cold called Tootie at home, not knowing what to expect. He lives in New Mexico. When I mentioned that Ron was doing the do- date, Tootie said, you know, he'd love to do it. So, in a sense, I was lucky that I already had Ron on board because that was what had made Tootie decide that he would like to do the record because he didn't know me. We we didn't meet till the first of the two sessions. Well, yeah. let, let's kind of go back into your history a little bit. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, like your childhood, where you were born and raised, and how jazz became your life. Oh, sure. Yeah, I grew up right down the road from where you are in Lee's Summit, which, by the way, I'm aware that Pat Metheny is from there. But um, isn't Pat from there, by the way? Yeah, you know, yeah. I, th- I mean, I moved here in January before the pandemic happened, and whenever I talk about it, the amount of stories and the attention that I get from being in Lee Summit because of Pat is unbelievable. I could write a book <laughs> based on that. <laughs> Well, I grew up down the road in Wichita, yeah, and you know, playing in garage bands there. That's how I started playing guitar. And then I, you know, one of the guys in our band, his father had a record collection. Uh, it was most, it was a lot of jazz and classical music, and we would put on those records sometime. And I didn't know anything about jazz at that point. I, but I remember hearing some of those records. And then we started collecting records. Um, uh, shoot, I remember. Oh, another another uh, kind of pivotal moment was when sort of a mentor of mine named Mike Finnegan, who used to coach our rock band. Mike is a keyboard player and singer who, among other things, played on one of Jimi Hendrix's records, played organ on on the record Electric Ladyland. But anyway, Mike had this record. He he sort of had a... He, you know, he knew I really wanted to get into guitar, so without saying it just like, you you think you want to play guitar here, he gave me a George Benson record called It's Uptown, and then he... uh, he had another record, the Jimi Hendrix Experience record, and I, at that point, you know, I was my playing was pretty, pretty un, undeveloped. I, I just didn't even understand that that's what you could do with a guitar. So that's how I gradually got into jazz from those two events, like my friend's father's record collection. And Mike Finnegan give me, giving me the, those two records. What about the first live jazz show that you saw that really blew you away? The first live jazz show that blew me away? Well, there actually wasn't too much jazz in Wichita, although there were a couple, couple interesting things. One was there was a club called Bill's La Gourmet at the time, and they would bring in the organ groups. And that's where I first heard Lou Donaldson's group. I heard Jack McDuff's group. I heard Gene Harrison, the three sounds there. And not knowing too much about those groups, but they were on, you know, they would travel it on that circuit. And that club in Wichita was part of their circuit. So I would hear, I can't remember who else, but other groups from back east and maybe maybe from the West Coast, too, but I I would hear those groups. And that was pretty influential. And the other thing was there was, a, there was a Wichita Jazz Festival at the time who, I think, I can't remember who I heard there, but uh, I think I, I remember hearing Freddie Hubbard live there. And I remember hearing... Terry Lynn Carrington as a young woman sitting in with somebody, 
maybe George Coleman, I can't remember, or Clark Terry. And there was another thing that happened in Wichita was that, I'm sure you know who Jay McShann is. Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't know who Jay McShann was, was, but a friend of mine, a girlfriend of mine, there was a... um, Jay McShann used to work in Wichita about six months out of the year just playing mostly at a little what they'd call a cocktail lounge out by the Wichita airport. And my girlfriend would say, hey, you gotta, you got to come with me and come here. There's this old guy that plays these country tunes and sings. And he was. He was playing country western songs uh, and singing. And occasionally his trio... Let me see, it was Jay and Claude Williams on Claude Fiddler Williams, but he wasn't playing violin, he was playing bass. And I remember he had a Dan Electro bass that he would play. And a drummer, I can't remember, the the drummer's name was Paul something. But occasionally when they'd take a break, they would play a jazz tune. And I remember them playing, I didn't know what song it was, but I found out later they would always play Airmail Special, this Charlie Christian Benny Goodman song for a break song. And I had no idea who Jay McShann was even then. But we would go out there countless times just to sit there and have a drink and listen to him. Uh, Later on when I found out who he was, I was like, that's who I was listening to? So there was sort of, I guess, influential experiences as far as my jazz development like those three but I don't know if I ever the things the the performances that knocked me out I think happened well there was a couple times I I moved to San Francisco for a year and I heard Chick Corea's band with Dave Holland and I was kind of knocked out by that and I heard uh I think Tony Williams' group, Tony Williams' Lifetime. And I had no idea what to think about that. But the, 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 I guess the listening experiences that I remember happened mostly in New York, just when I moved here and just heard, I just remember when I first moved here going to some, I don't even remember the name of the club, but it was, Lewis Hayes was playing drums and Sam Jones was playing bass and I think Cedar Walton was playing piano and just thinking this is what I'm up against (laughs) (laughs) so I was pretty naive at that point which probably was a good thing otherwise I would have packed up and left well this was your first album in quite a long time in this kind of a setting has it been because you've just been busy doing a lot of live gigs or kind of how have things been transpiring for you over the years? My records are sort of far between. I've got six records. I don't usually, I guess I don't really record unless I feel like I have something to say or something I really want to do, something that might set them apart from the one before or you know, sort of a concept that I think is really important that I want to say. So I think the last record, my last record was um, more of a, for lack of a better term, rock jazz excursion. It was called Soul Mation. I think it came out in 2017. Yeah, I, I don't, I guess I don't, um, it took takes usually about four or five years between my records. But this one, from playing with Ron, and I'd recorded that record, Soulmation. I had already worked with Ron during that time, but I I think the first couple times I'd worked with Ron, I never really thought about recording with him because I think I was still getting comfortable with being around an icon. But about the third time, I started, um, just thought, boy, this this guy, I really started to understand the way he thinks musically, and I that's when I decided I wanted to record with him. And so, uh, I mean, that's kind of what 
was the sort of concept. That's when it, the concept for recording this record kind of came about. Oh, and also I, I had been playing pretty much before this, before several years ago, I'd mostly been exploring the, the organ trio concept. I really liked organ trio, but just um, a lot of the gigs I'd been getting around town were at a, say, a venue where better off not having an organ or just uh, a more of an intimate setting where it seemed like guitar and bass and drums were a better, a better, you know, combination. So I got, and uh, from doing those gigs, say at clubs like Smalls and Mesro, I got a little more comfortable with playing in a trio setting. And I got more comfortable with the space, you know, the musical space that you can leave with that instead of trying to fill it all up. And I started to enjoy that, that, you know, that uh, challenge of, you know, everything's on me, the melody, the harmony, and whatever else, you know, I... In an organ trio, the guitar player can sort of lean on the organ a bit. You know, you can let him do a lot of things that, that you know, in a guitar trio you have to do yourself. But I started to get into it and started to enjoy the the freedom, the openness of that, of the trio and not always feeling like I had to fill it up. You know, we're obviously in a very unique time during this pandemic and everything that's going on. And when you look back to this time last year before everything shut down, what do you miss the most? What are you looking forward to getting back to once things kind of open up? Oh, and Oh, for yeah. sure, live gigs and just not even, even, even just going out and hearing live music because I miss that sense of community that... Uh, in a, on a, when I watch a live stream, I can sort of, sort of get a little bit of that, but I can't really walk up to somebody and say, "Hey, I really dug what was going on." Well, you know, I can't, I can't really talk to anybody, the musicians, or I can't, you know, sit at the bar with someone and have a conversation. That's I sort of I miss that. I miss seeing the other musicians and the people and being you know close to them yeah that's yeah. that's what i really miss and i think eventually it's going to get back to that yeah i think so yeah i think yeah. It, because it's already started here in new york the clubs were live streaming for a while i think a lot of them now are just getting starting to they they open the club to patrons to a certain percentage like maybe 25 I, I can't remember what it is but there are people attending the shows now which is that's a great start well when we do get back what do you hope we all realize about this long absence from live music both musician and the audience I think there's a silver lining which is I think it has given a lot of musicians a time for self-reflection and to think about what you're doing and what you really like for myself speaking just for myself and I assume a lot of others I have a lot of time to look at you know think about my music and think about what I really want to do with it it's uh, that it's a good thing and think about I mean it might not be that long until I make another record now, <laughs> just because I've had time to think about it. Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but you're the one that's living your life. Who do you think you are? Well, I'm serious about music and life. I I don't know if that always comes across. Uh, I don't know if I would want it. You know, that's not the first thing you want people to think about you, but... Uh, for a long time, I always, I've always, uh, I've realized that life is short, 
and I want to make the most of every day and the time. Not that I always do that, but that's my intention, and to try to contribute to something to the society in this world that that is good, meaning music or for somehow give people some enjoyment. I guess that's how I think of myself a lot of times. I try to do something positive every day. and I enjoy living in New York. I, I don't know if I'll always live here, but I enjoy the the um, all the the melting pot and the variety of different cultures and it's I think it's a good thing to be able to to see for people to see you know try to appreciate different people and realize that there are differences that don't that you know can be a good thing I yeah. mean that's I think that's another thing I like um I think about myself I I try to except that not everybody's like me. Yeah. And maybe yeah. try to understand what makes them tick and you know, learn a little bit about people and their history and see why they are the way they are. It's probably like that in say in Lee's Summit too. In ex- I mean, I'm I think when I grew up in Wichita there weren't that many I don't remember that many cultures, like especially Asian cultures, as there are there now. I mean, it's mm-hmm. surprising. That there's, you know, you can find food of all different kinds, even in Kansas and Missouri, which is a good thing, don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah, and even here in Kansas City proper too. I mean, you know, as you know, how these places sprawl out. Kansas City Metro is quite big, so yeah. I agree. And, totally. and Kansas City Kansas City is a little bit more cosmopolitan than Wichita, it's true. I always liked Kansas City. I remember it's a I've, great got town. A, I've got a funny story about my first band. We tried to get a gig in Kansas City. We were you know, Wichita's about hundred and fifty miles away, so we would go up there and hit on club owners and try to get a gig and we finally got a a gig at this one club i still remember the name it was called some other place but we got a gig and you know we we did that gig and then we we were trying to get another date at the club and the guy was dodging us so we were uh <laughs> and we were at in steve cardenas's parents house when this happened we were in there trying to think of how we would do this so the drummer for our band called up the club and asked acted like he was just a fan of our band and asked when we would be playing there again and the guy said and so he got excited when the he said oh okay thanks and he hung up the phone he said the guy said february 29th or no i think it was february 30th and we all said what We've got a gig, and then we heard one of, one of the people in the room, it was Steve Cardenas' mother, started laughing. And then we all realized, oh, there's never a February 30th. No. <laughs> no. Oh, man. That's wild. <laughs> Good wink, for sure. Yeah. No, it's a great town. It's uh, And before the pandemic happened, you know, it was really, really thriving. There was so much going on. There was people... Moving here, it was Adam Larson moved from New York to here, and who's there's that? Just Adam Larson moved here. Saxophone. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. He relocated here, and there's been other people that have done the same, or they just haven't left after they've gone to school with Bobby Watson at UMKC. So there's been a lot of really good stuff going on. I'm sure we'll get back to it in, in oh, every sure. yeah, jazz yeah. city. You know, and um, the Blue Room, yeah, the Gem Theater. Yeah, totally. It's got to be, man. With the legacy of Kansas City Jazz, there's, they've, it, there's, I hope there will always be clubs there. I think there will be. I think it's just, it's just, it's hard to look back at last year, 
and oh, realize, is. you know, just how well things were going for this town and to see things that have happened and transpired. And it's been everywhere. It's been global. But we'll get back. It'll, it'll be good. People are, um, people are excited. I, I think there's a lot of things that are, you know, the weather's going to start getting warmer. I think there's a lot of things to look forward to. Um, we've really lived through quite a bit. I think it's time for the universal karma to start kicking in and letting things kind of happen. Um, and uh, I think yeah. you're right, and some positivity will take over. Yeah, absolutely. Whether it's yeah. real or placebo or perceived, we can use anything we can get. I appreciate it. Thanks, Greg. Thanks a bunch, Joe. Take care. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Wichita, New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Greg for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. <laughs> Neon Jazz.